Well, today I want to turn to the philosophy of mind, because remember that as Descartes contemplating all of this, he is thinking not just that he exists and that he thinks, but he asks, what am I? What is René Descartes? <laughs> okay, and the answer is, well, I am a thing that thinks. In fact, I am essentially a thing that thinks. Thinking is not something that can be separated from me in the way that other things can be separated from me. My toenails can be separated from me. Uh, it's very painful, but I've actually done it, and <laughs> it was still me. I was still me in great pain, but nevertheless, I was still me, right? But it's not the case with my thinking mind. Of course, I can stop thinking in a moment. There's this old joke. Uh, Descartes goes into a bar. The bartender comes over and says, will you have another beer? He says, I think not. And poof, he disappears. Uh, <laughs> but that's sort of silly. I mean, the idea is that thinking is really essential to him. If he weren't a thinking being, he wouldn't be Descartes. It's not that if he weren't thinking at that moment, he wouldn't be Descartes, but at least if he weren't a thinking thing, he wouldn't be. It's really essential to him. And he concludes that he knows his own mind more clearly, more securely, more centrally than he knows anything else. Why? Not everything about his mind, of course, but the fact that he is a thinking thing, and the fact that things appear to him in a certain way, and so on. That he thinks, that he is, those things are more clear than anything else. Now, here's how he lays this out. He says, surely my awareness of my own self is not merely much truer and more certain than my awareness of wax, for example, but also much more distinct and evident. Now, he goes through this example of the wax, which we've talked about in connection with Plato and Aristotle. I don't want to go into the details here with Descartes and how he's actually using it. But for our purposes, what will matter here is that the wax changes, remember? It's at one point solid, and it has a certain smell to it. And then it melts under heat, and it no longer is solid. It's now liquid. It has a different smell, a different texture. And every sensible property it seems to have is different. And so Descartes looks at that and says, gosh, so what is the wax really? It must be something that I understand purely mentally by grasping its essence. It's not something that I grasp in terms of its sensible qualities because they can change. He says, here, yeah, it turns out when you think about something like wax or another physical object, my understanding of it is actually much subtler than you might initially think. But he says, on the other hand, I can turn inside and I have a much more evident impression of myself. He says, for if I judge that the wax exists from the fact that I see it, clearly this same fact entails much more evidently that I myself also exist. After all, I have a certain impression of the wax, I have a certain thought about it, but all of those impressions, all of those thoughts presuppose that I exist. I'm the one who perceives the wax as being solid or not solid. I'm the one who actually thinks, hey, that's wax. <laughs> and so my, existing, my existence, and moreover, my existence as a thinking thing, is really presupposed by all of that. He says it's possible that what I see isn't really the wax. It's possible I don't have, even have eyes which wish, with which to see anything. Maybe I'm really a brain in a vat being probed by some science. And the scientist is just thinking, ooh, let's make him think about wax. Poke, poke. <laughs> and that's what's happening. Could be. He says it's possible I don't even have eyes, let alone seeing this particular wax. But when I see or think I see, it's simply not possible that I, who am now thinking, am not something. So I could be wrong about the wax. I could be wrong about having sensory organs at all. I could be wrong about all sorts of things, but I can't be wrong that I think. I can't be wrong that I am. So we've talked about, <laughs> well, this Simpson episode. Um, we're going to see another little bit of the Simpsons in a moment. But here's the thought that underlies this. If this is right, if I am essentially a thing that thinks, and thinking, being a thinking being, is essential to me in a way that nothing else is, not even having sense organs, not even having a body, then that means mind and body must be distinct. I am necessarily, essentially, a thing that thinks. But I am not essentially a thing that has a body. I am not essentially a thing that has eyes, or ears, or any other sensory organ. And so that tells him that actually my, the thinking part of me and my body must be distinct substances. One is separable for me, the other is not. And so, because that's true, because one is separable and one is not, they can't be the same thing. So, he holds a position known as dualism. Dualism meaning there are two kinds of things here, mind and body, and they are distinct kinds of things. They are, in principle, separable. Well, if that's right, 
we've got a kind of puzzle that arises. This is a puzzle known traditionally as the mind-body problem. If mind and body are two distinct substances, if they are, at least in principle, separable, if I'm essentially a thing that thinks, but not essentially a thing that has a body, and yet I do have a body, I think, how does my mind relate to my body? How is, as St. Carp puts it, their union, an apparent intermingling, possible? After all, I consist then primarily of a mind. I am a thinking thing. But also, <laughs> I have a body, and my body seems to respond in various ways to my mind. My mind responds to my body. So they're mixed up together somehow. How is that possible? And that is indeed the mind-body problem. In fact, it takes two forms, because you can think about the effects going in both directions. You can say, how is it that what's happening to my body has an effect on my mind? That's the problem of sensation. Right now, my eyes are scanning the classroom, and that creates certain impressions within my mind. Or I slap my own arm, and I feel a sensation of pain. And that's something that shows my body having an effect on my mind. But also, my mind can have an effect on my body. This is called the problem of mental causation. For example, I decide mentally I'm going to raise my hand. And look, I do. My body responds. Or I think, I'm going to make a silly face. And then my body responds. Or I think I'm going to walk around like John Cleese in an old Monty Python episode. <laughs> and look, my body does it. And so my mind can have an effect on my body, but my body also has an effect on my mind. Well, if they're two totally separate things, how does that happen? Now, notice it's not the case that two separate things in general can't interact causally. Of course they can. This hand can hit this other hand. Or suppose I'm playing pool, and I hit the cue ball, and it goes and hits another ball, and that goes into the pocket, and so, or if it's like the way I usually play pool, it doesn't go into the pocket. In fact, uh, when, when, I, when my daughter was very young, my brother and I were playing pool, and she, she was watching us for a while, and finally she said, can I try it? So we said, sure. So she tried it. <laughs> she thought, okay, here's what you do. You hit the white ball, you see what happens, and then you say, damn it. <laughs> anyway, that was embarrassing. Um, but that's sort of the problem. It, we've got things that, are, that can interact, and if it's billiard balls, we have a theory about how they can interact, after all, they're both physical. And so it's not too surprising that two physical things can interact. But the mind doesn't seem to be a physical thing, and so that creates a kind of puzzle. We have a theory about the interaction of physical things. We just don't have a theory about the interaction between body and mind. And so that's not a proof that there can't be any interaction. It's just a puzzle. How on earth do they interact? Well, one position to have about this is dualism. This is Descartes' position. Mind and body really are distinct. And the problem, then, is to explain that interaction. We've got two separate things. And so we have to have a theory of sensation, how it's possible for the body to affect the mind, and then also mental causation, how it's possible for the mind to affect the body. Now, that's something that remains a serious problem. And it's something that knowing more neurophysiology, in a sense, helps with. But there's a certain problem left over. Suppose it happens that every time I decide to raise my hand, for example, something happens inside my brain. And we can actually figure out neurophysiologically what's happening in my brain. We say, aha, it's this cluster of neurons right here that seems to be controlling the hand motion. So whenever they fire, the hand rises. Well, that tells us something, right? But it just pushes the problem one step back. What's the connection between my intention to raise my hand and those neurons firing? Is that intention just the same as those neurons firing? Is it something that causes those neurons to fire? It feels like the intention is purely mental. And yet somehow, that's connected to that neural firing that then is connected to the rising of my hand. And so knowing lots of neurophysiology, in a sense, helps. I used to, when I was younger, think the neuro neuroscientists would, in the end, solve this problem for us. But now I think that's not quite right. There's still an explanatory gap, as people talk about, between the conscious state, my sense of intending to do something, and then whatever might happen in my brain, and how exactly are those connected. That's not an easy problem to solve. This also creates a problem, you might say, in understanding what the mind is. We have uh, some understanding of what physical things are. We have physics to try to tell us something about the nature of the physical world. But what about the mind itself? 
You could say, well, psychology does something equivalent. On the other hand, notice that psychology doesn't really identify basic objects in the mind, the way physics identifies basic objects in the universe. Psychology doesn't exactly establish laws in the same sense that physics does. And so what would it be like to really have a theory of what the mind is if it's distinct from the body? There is a sort of puzzle, notice, that arises here. If we really think mind and body are distinct, and they are separable in, well, something like that way, then we've got a problem of how they interact. What does it mean when that mind goes back into that body? What on earth is going on there? Well, this is a set of problems raised really for the first time, I think, by Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. She was a prominent classicist. In fact, she was due to become queen, uh, and then her father lost his throne, and various bad things happened to her throughout her life. But in any event, she ended up becoming a prominent classicist and having a correspondence with Descartes that lasted for a number of years. She actually has a very nice statement of the mind-body problem. She says, I ask you to tell me how man's soul, being only a thinking substance, can determine animal spirits so as to cause voluntary actions. Now, this is a way of putting the problem of mental causation. How is it possible for a person's soul or mind, that is to say the part of you that is not bodily, being a thinking substance and essentially a thinking substance can actually affect voluntary actions, like the raising of the arm or like doing a silly walk. How is it possible for something that is not bodily to actually interact with the body? Now, this is a sort of serious puzzle. Um, it's a puzzle of how a mental state could cause a bodily motion. And in fact, she points out this is more serious than it might first appear. Because initially you might think, look, okay, yeah, you're telling me we need a theory. We don't have a theory yet, but fine. We can come up with some theory of how it's possible for these two things to interact. It won't be the same as physics talking about how one billiard ball interacts with another billiard ball, let's say. But nevertheless, it could be in principle possible to come up with something. So initially the thought that, hey, these are things of very different kinds, how do they interact? That's more a challenge than an argument. It's really saying that there's a part that has to be filled in. We need to know how this interaction is possible and how it works. But she goes further than that. She says, look, we have a theory about what causes bodily motions. And that theory is physics. Well, here's the problem. <laughs> physics portrays the universe as causally closed. That is to say, physics says, all right, you've got a motion. Here are the kinds of things that cause those motions. So on the billiard table, you've got a variety of forces acting, including the force of friction. And you should be able to calculate, given all of that, what's going to happen to the ball that's struck. Well, OK, in doing that, you're talking about physical causes. The same thing happens with gravitation. If I hold these keys up and drop them, we can calculate what's going to happen on the basis of purely physical consideration. There it goes. But now, that creates a kind of puzzle, a puzzle of too many causes, if you want to think of it that way. Physics seems to be complete. It says, here are the kinds of things that cause motions in the physical world. Here is what causes things to happen. And it gives you a set of laws that are supposed to determine all of that. Well, that's the difficulty. Physics already gives you an explanation of bodily motions. So I raise my hand. We should, in terms of neurophysiology, be able to give an account of actually what's going on there. Or let's say that I walk forward. We can give an explanation of the motions of my feet in purely physical terms. But now somebody says, well, I have another explanation. You intended to walk forward. You intended to raise your hand. And it looks like there's no place for that in the theory. We've already got an account, an account in terms of forces, in terms here of neural impulses and electrical interactions and things like that, then muscular contractions. All of that is an explanation for why my hands move. And so what's left for these mental explanations to do? What role could mental causation play? Everything else has already been caused. So we've got a difficulty here that goes beyond that, hey, there's a gap that needs to be filled in. It looks as if we've got a full explanation of everything that needs to be explained. Now, in principle, of course, if you go into a physics class and say to the physics professor, explain the raising of my hand, that's a hugely complicated thing, right? Nobody's actually going to be able to do that. But they'll point to the kinds of things. And in general, we tend to think that physics explains what goes on in the universe. Well, what's left for the mind to do? There's another problem that she gives. This is a problem about extension. 
just look, causes, insofar as we understand what the term means, have to be extended in space. Give me some examples of one thing causing another. Paradigm cases of, of you know, what you take to be examples of causation. I've already given you one in terms of the billiard ball, one billiard ball hitting another. What are some other examples of causes? Just in common sense terms, yeah. Good, you press down on the gas pedal on the car and the car moves forward, it accelerates. Okay, so that's something that seems like a causal interaction. Notice it's extended in space. You're pressing your foot down on the accelerator and then various things happen and the car actually starts moving or if it's already moving, starts accelerating. What are some other examples of causation? Yeah. Dominoes. Dominoes, good. If we set up some dominoes, knock over one and then the whole chain of dominoes starts falling. That's, notice, extended in space. We talk about the position of this domino, this striking this one and exerting a force on it, that one doing the same to the next, and so forth. All of that is spatial. And so our ordinary understanding of these causal relations has them taking place in space. But now here's the difficulty. Mental acts are not spatial. But if you say, you've had an intention to raise your arm, where was your intention? I don't know how to answer that question. Or maybe you would like to get a degree. And I say, well, where is that design? Maybe you say, it's within me. I say, well, where's that? Well, in Texas. OK, <laughs> that seems safe, I guess. <laughs> but it's really hard to locate that. It's like, wait, is your desire in your hand? No. <laughs> is it in your face? No. It, it's in my mind, right? Well, where is your mind? Now, we're tempted to say, oh, up here. <laughs> Okay, but that's not something that's for a long time been obvious. We have a theory of the brain, and so we think mind has this special relation to the brain as opposed to the heart or as opposed to the pineal gland or some other thing. But now this raises a certain question, which is, well, wait a minute. <laughs> the brain, I know where that is in space, but where is the mind in relation to that brain? And that becomes a sort of problem. We could identify the mind with the brain, and some people have tried to do that. Then we've got something that's extended, and then we can solve this problem. But notice, as soon as we're doing that, we're no longer dualists. We're not saying there are two different kinds of things here. We're saying what appears to be mind is really a body. So anyway, that is one way out, as we'll see. Here is how Descartes answered Princess Elizabeth's challenge. He said, well, look, we perceive the interaction of the mind and the body all the time. So I do look around me and I perceive things. My, my body receives certain images, let's say, um, and translates, translates them into another form and puts them into the brain, which constructs the images that are actually before my mind. That's a case of body affecting mind. Or I make the decision to jump. And that decision to jump is a case of my decision then having an effect on my body. <laughs> So he says, look, the union of mind and body is known very clearly by the senses. We perceive the interaction all the time. I intend to move, and lo and behold, I move. Or, you know, I go to the gym, and I intend to lift weights. And so I pick up the heavy weight, and I lift it, and I say, oh, yeah, see, I have the intention, and then it makes my body do something. <laughs> oh, but, but, yeah, while I'm on this, my favorite exercise in the gym is something called the Sven Press, for this Swedish bodybuilder Sven. And what you do is you just take this dumbbell and you go like this. And it's much harder than it looks. And it also just gives you this... So you feel like Arnold as you're doing it. Oh, yeah. It's well up, it's great. Then it goes away. It's like, then you return to normal. But for a moment there, you feel wonderful. Okay. By the way, everybody else in the gym, when I do this, looks at me like I'm insane. <laughs> Nobody else does this exercise. Except Sven. <laughs> well, anyway. Okay, back to this. Um, Look, the union of mind and body is something we're all familiar with in all sorts of contexts, he's saying. But now you might say, look, that misses the point. Princess Elizabeth isn't really saying, I don't think they interact. She's saying, I want to understand how they interact, how they interact if they're two separate things. And only one of these things is spatial. And that thing, by the way, is physical. And we have a full theory of what causes physical things. And it's other physical things. It isn't something outside the physical realm. So I don't understand how any of this is possible. Now, the view that they do interact and that we can, in principle, give some kind of theory of how they interact is called, unimaginatively, interactionism. <laughs> and so Descartes' view is usually described as interactionism. They are distinct substances and they do interact. 
You can push the physical side back to the brain, for example, but in the end you've got this puzzle. How does my intention, my consciousness of a certain state of mind intending to raise my arm actually issue in the neurophysiological event that leads to the raising of my arm? Well, in principle, Descartes seems to be saying there is an interaction there between a spiritual substance or a thinking substance and a physical substance. And we don't know how it works, but in principle, there is such an inter interaction we have to explain. It. it will be a different kind of explanation from a physical explanation. But on the other hand, you might say, that's not so surprising. If somebody says, why did you go to the library? You can say, oh, because they recalled the book. Uh, and that makes perfect sense. You don't really say, well, you see, I had this series of neurophysiological episodes in my brain that led my legs to start moving toward the library. Uh, you don't give a physical explanation. You explain things in terms of, well, your purpose in going here. But that's a mental thing. So we use those kinds of mental explanations all the time. And you might say, they point toward this kind of interaction. We just have to explain how they're doing it. There's an explanation of a different kind. And we need a theory of how that works. A lot of people were unsatisfied with that, though, because they didn't see how it was going to be possible to give a theory of these interactions. And so a certain number of philosophers, especially of this period around Descartes' time and shortly thereafter, ended up having a view that is known as occasionalism. And here's the idea. God is actually the only true cause of things. And God is something like the conductor of the universe. So the mental is causing other mental things, right? I have a desire to raise my hand, and that leads to an intention to raise my hand, and that leads to a perception that my hand is actually rising, and so all of that's happening on the mental sphere. We've got the mental thing causing another thing, it seems, and so on and so forth and so on. And we've got the bodily motions of the neurophysiological event leading to the electrical impulses, leading to the muscular contractions, leading to the motion. And God is something like the conductor, okay? It's not as if there's any real interaction going on, any more than the, the trumpets playing that note causes the violins to play over here. It's rather that they're both following the conductor. So the conductor is conducting and looks over to the violins, and the violins are doing their thing, and then looks over to the trumpets, and the trumpets are doing their thing. And there might actually be no musician who has the full score. They might each have their own part. But nevertheless, the conductor makes it all work together. So that's a view that says, well, there really is that in the interaction. But luckily, you know, I have this intention to raise my arm, and, and wow, my arm raises. And that's awesome. And how does it happen? Because God's coordinating my intentions and my emotions. At least normally, right? I mean, maybe I'm paralyzed and I intend to raise my arm and can't do it. Or I'm in a dream and I'm intending to run away from the monster and I can't do it. So it doesn't always work out that way, but normally God is conducting the universe so it all works out. Now, what do you think of that? Yeah, nobody's actually giving me an objection. They're just frowning at me. David Lewis had a term for that. He said, you know, when I give my theory, I'm not really met with objections, but just with incredulous stares. <laughs> and this is one of those views that prompts that. It's like, oh yeah, mind and body don't interact, but it all works out because God's conducting it perfectly. <laughs> really? Really? Uh, and it's hard to say more. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think it's kind of like the easiest answer. So well, okay, good. It is, in a way, the easiest answer you can give. And I mean... Listen, I don't mean what I'm about to say to speak against religion or against any particular style of philosophy. But if you've got God, then in a way, it's like having a winning hand in poker stuff in your shirt or something, <laughs> right? And you just whip it out whatever you want. Like, I can't explain this, so, so God did it. <laughs> and that's, a, that's not a good use, right, of a religious impulse. So uh, it's... Anyway, you, you might think, yeah, well, this is like the, the simplest possible explanation. How do mind and body interact when they don't? It's just all held together by God. Um, God who's constantly interfering in the universe, right, and orchestrating all things. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, it does require, it has a lot of presuppositions. It requires you to believe in God. It requires you to believe that God is causing not just the universe at the beginning or an occasional miracle, but every single thing. You know, you decide to stand up when the bell rings at the end of class, and you've got to imagine that 
actually God is keeping your attention to stand up and you're standing up together. And so every single thing you do is an act of God. And that's, that's not just believing in God. That's a really <laughs> radical position about the way in which God interacts with the universe. Well, here's another way to think of it. This is Leibniz's answer. There's a pre-established harmony between mind and body. And so God coordinates all this from the beginning. There is this causal chain of things happening mentally. There's this causal chain of things happening physically. And God winds it all up in the beginning so that it works out. Sort of like these two clocks. Imagine that there are two clocks. One of them set to central time. The other set to eastern time. And they have this consistent pattern. So when one shows one o'clock, the other shows two. When one of them shows 3.45, the other 4.45, and so on. Well, you might think, gosh, are they constantly interacting so that these two clocks stay coordinated one hour apart? No, you just wound them up, set them that way initially, and then they just go. And so Leibniz's idea is that God winds up the universe, the physical universe, so that it's going to go in a certain <laughs> pattern. And then he winds up the mental universe so it goes in a certain pattern. And then each one proceeds independently, but in perfect harmony, not because God's conducting at each point and keeping them together, but because they were just pre-designed to stay. Well, how's that? Better? Yeah. Um, it's so <clears throat> weird that you would say that, the, that there's no connection between the two and the that they run separately, but they still match. Yeah, yeah. It's... I mean, it, it is strange, right? I mean, you can give examples with the clock or other things, and yet you have this feeling that there's something incredible about this, right? I mean, I'm intending to go like this with my hands, but my hands are going like that. And you think, whoa, good thing the Big Bang was set up that way, and along with God's, you know, whatever the equipment of the Big Bang is mentally. Uh, and it's, it's all luckily working out. It, 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 I mean, yeah, it's, it's a weird, weird idea. <clears throat> Of course, that doesn't mean it's false. The universe might be weird. <laughs> Here are other possibilities. You might be a monist. That is to say, you say, look, dualism was wrong from the beginning. It's a mistake to think that mind and body are separable and that they are distinct kinds of things. Maybe the mental and the physical are, in fact, one kind of thing. So the idealist says, look, everything is really mental. You think certain things are material, but they're physical, but actually they're just mental. And so, really, we're within the mind the whole time. The physicalist says, well, everything is really body. You might think there are these mental things, like thoughts, perceptions, feelings, desires, and then there are these physical things, but actually everything is physical. What you think of as a thought, a perception, a feeling, a desire, is really just some sort of physical event, or a kind of physical event, or something like that, that is connected to the brain. And so everything is really body. You could, by the way, also be a neutral monist. Bertrand Russell was at one point, which says both mind and body are some other third thing. Um, and I think Zen Buddhism actually has a view similar to that, that in the end it's all the same. But it's not mind exactly, it's not body exactly, it's some other thing. Um, which is also a popular view in Taoism. It's all the Tao. And the Tao is somehow, sometimes expressed physically and sometimes mentally. But in the end, there's just this one thing that they both manifest. And so in the modern scene, people have said all sorts of things about these. We're not going to really go into these in detail. I just want you to see there are a number of ways in which you might try to explain the connection between mind and body. One of them is reductionism. You might think everything we say about the mind could just be translated into something about the body. So if I say I intend to move my arm upward, maybe if you knew enough neurophysiology, you could say, ah, oh, that's really something I can capture in terms of a certain description of a kind of event in the brain. Um, that gets, I mean, that seems kind of plausible if I have in mind something really, really specific, but if I have something in mind more general, like I'm reminiscing about Pittsburgh, <laughs> what's the equivalent of reminiscing about Pittsburgh in neurophysiological terms? I have no idea. The second thing, functionalism. Maybe the mental language that we use, talking of thoughts, feelings, desires, and physical language are just two ways of describing the same thing. In something like the way software and hardware are two ways of describing what's going on in a computer, I could say, ah, it's saving the file. Or I could say the following physical processes are happening. And actually, if I'm giving software descriptions, I could do it at many different levels. I might say, here I'm saving the file, or here's what's going on in machine language underlying all of that. Um, those are just different ways of describing exactly the same events. 
And so you might think mental language and physical language can't be translated into each other, but nevertheless, they're just two ways of describing the same thing. You could think, well, it's more abstract than that, maybe. The physical is determining the mental. I can't imagine two people who are in exactly the same brain state, you might think, having different mental states. Ooh, but what if one is really remembering something that happened, but the other is imagining something and thinking it happened when it didn't? As a hallucination, let's say. It might be the same brain state, but one's remembering and the other's hallucinating. And then you say, well, think of the whole history of their mental states. So this becomes more complicated than it at first sounds. And then grounding. You might think the mental is in some way grounded in the physical. But then what exactly that means and what sort of relation that is becomes another puzzle. So anyway, if you encounter recent discussions of this over the last few decades, you find terms like this thrown about. But really, in the end, the problem's the same. The mental doesn't seem to be physical. So how do we understand its relation to the physical? Well, Descartes does give us an argument, as we've seen, about clarity and distinctness. And I want to go back to that for a moment, because there is a key element of the argument that we haven't yet filled in. And that is, remember, we were concerned with the fact that I might be trapped within my own mind. <laughs> I can know that I exist. I can know that I am. I can know that I think. In fact, I can know that I'm a thinking thing. But what else? So far, I'm just within my mind. Can I know, for example, that I have a hand? Can I know that anybody else exists in the world? Well, go back to clarity and distinctness. We saw this argument about the possibility of certainty that went like this. It is possible for me to be certain of something, that I exist, for example. And so certainty is possible. But wait a minute, that could be possible only if what appears to me to be clear and distinct, I should say what appears clearly and distinctly to me, um, is true. So I can trust that what appears to me clearly and distinctly is true. Well, that's an argument we considered last time. So maybe this clarity and distinctness is something that really can serve as a ground of certainty. In other words, I seem to be certain of some things. What makes that certainty possible? The fact that I'm able to trust my clear and distinct perceptions. But now, well, we worried about that argument a little bit. But now what about external things? What about the existence of the table or my hand? Can I be sure of that? He says, well, here is why I tend to have this perception that there are really physical things, that I do have a hand, that there really is a table, that in short, things outside of me really do exist. It's because sensations come to me involuntarily. If I think right now, I would like to have an ice cream, Nothing happens. Nothing happens at all. Suppose I think, oh, I wish this thing in my pocket were not my car key, but instead a million dollar bill. Is there a million dollar bill? I don't think there is. A hundred thousand I think is as big as it gets. But okay, a hundred thousand dollar bill. Still the key to an old Jetta, okay? <laughs> it doesn't work. And other things happen to me involuntarily, and I can't stop them. Suppose I say, oh, I woke up this morning with such a pain in my wrist. And somebody says, well, you want that pain? No. So just make it go away. Right? I mean, I don't know how to do that, right? And so these sensations come to me involuntarily. Now, they're caused, therefore, by something external to me. If it's something internal to me, couldn't I have control over it? For example, right now, I want to imagine that instead of talking to a room full of UT students, I'm talking to a room full of duplicates of Donald Trump. <laughs> Look, you're still there. <laughs> Didn't happen, okay? Um, and so it looks as if this is being controlled by something outside me, not by anything inside me. Well, the conclusion is then there must exist something outside me. Okay, if it's not happening due to anything that I'm doing, it must be something that's being done to me from outside. And so there must be something external to me. Well, how do we get from the involuntariness to the external part. After all, couldn't there be something inside me that is involuntary, but nevertheless producing this? Could there be something inside me that I have no control over, but is actually producing perceptions in the way that you might think something inside me produces a desire? Well, what we'd have to do is show that there could be nothing inside me that could be causing these sensations. I don't have control over them, but maybe there are parts of my mind over which I have no control. And so, I've got to show there's no internal source 
And only then should I be able to conclude that, to conclude that there's an external source. But how could I wipe it out? Here is where he brings in the dualism. He says, the essence of my mind is thinking. That is wholly distinct from the essence of the body. The essence of the body is, well, it's a physical thing, and so it's physics that in the end describes the true nature of my body. And that is different from being a thinking thing. Being a thinking thing, in fact, doesn't appear in physics at all. And so the essence of my mind is wholly distinct from the essence of my body. But that means, he concludes, <laughs> that nothing can be in me, that is to say, in my mind, of which I am not aware. Why? Because my mind is a thinking thing. Everything that could be before the mind is something I could think about. Now, I might not be thinking about it at that moment, but the mind is, as it were, purely transparent. And so there can't be any hidden parts of it, any parts that I don't have access to, any parts of it that are generating these perceptions of the external world. Consequently, they must be coming from something outside me. Now, reactions to that. Yeah. Right. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Today, we are used to the idea of a subconscious mind. Okay? Freud introduced that notion. And although almost no psychologists anymore are Freudians, nevertheless, the thought that there are parts of my mind that are hidden from me, and so operations in my mind that I'm, are not, I'm not aware of, is something that we sort of take for granted. To Descartes, that would have been a shocking idea. The mind is something that is conscious, and it's something like this little pinpoint of consciousness <laughs> that is producing these thoughts, and what's in it is just what is before the mind, what I'm conscious of. So there aren't any spaces for it to be hidden. It's something like the movie theater, in which there's nothing but consciousness and then what's on the screen. There is no hidden projector that could be there within the mind. But we're used to the idea that there could be. Maybe there is a hidden projector that's actually projecting all of this. Freud gave us the id, which was this subconscious source of desires and urges and so forth. But even in modern cognitive psychology, although there's nothing quite like that, there are all sorts of operations of which we're really not consciously aware. Here is one indication. Suppose, oh, it's too bad I don't have a, a laser pointer or something like that. But suppose I did, and suppose I went like this, and you saw the, the little dot enter the screen, and then halfway through, I shot it off and said, now where would it have come out on the other side of the screen? You would all be able to point that out, and really accurately. And yes, how are you doing? You're doing some kind of calculating. Right? You're thinking, aha, it went like this, and then it stopped. The path would have gone like this. There's where it would have ended up. You're very good at doing it, and yet you're not aware of how you're doing it. Suppose I said, so, you know, are you computing the function? Are you like, are you, now this is a quadratic equation, or maybe a hyperbola or something? Well, I mean, what's happening here? Uh, you're unaware of any of it, right? It's not like you say, oh, I realized that was a hyperbola. It was going to come up. No, you don't do any of that. Somehow you just know. And so all of the calculations your mind is performing there are somehow hidden from you. So to us, it's not a strange thought that the mind might have all sorts of operations, all sorts of sources that are hidden from consciousness. But at Descartes' time, that really would have been viewed as a radical possibility. He didn't even think of that. So in the end, he says, you know, look, it can't be anything inside me or I'd be aware of. We can now say, hmm, yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> Could my body be the source? Could God? And he says, no, it couldn't be any of those either. God has given me a great propensity to believe that my sensations come from external objects. And he says, moreover, God has given me no faculty for correcting any erroneous beliefs about this. So a good God wouldn't allow me to be wrong about it. After all, I've got this great propensity to think that these sensations are coming from outside. Not that my mind is somehow projecting this entire universe. But would a good God set it up so that I, I were constantly deceived? No. Now, have we proved yet that God exists, that God is good? No. But that's the task for next week. <laughs> Descartes gives us actually two arguments for God's existence. And he tries to argue that we can get from clear and distinct ideas to the existence of God, and then to God's being good, and then to God's 
not being a potential source for all of this, and in fact setting things up so that my mind does actually accurately portray the world, at least normally, most of the time. So next week we'll come back and look at those arguments. <laughs>